Hello and welcome to today's episode. In today's episode, I want to teach you from Philippians chapter number 2, verse 1 through 4, as Paul addresses the church at Philippi. Kind of under this sort of unusual subject, can't we all just get along? Stay tuned, I'll be right back. Welcome back to today's episode. I am Bishop A.R. Littman, and I'm happy to share this teaching with you. If you like the video, I hope you'll give it a thumbs up. Please consider being a subscriber to our channel and hit that bell notification. That way, every time new content is loaded, you'll be among the first to receive it. Well, in today's episode, we see the Apostle Paul as he is now shifting from chapter number one, where he informs the church of their necessity of staying true to the teachings of Christ and being good examples in the world, lifting up a standard, although Christianity was being persecuted at the time. Remember, Paul was already in prison himself, and this letter to the church at Philippi was an opportunity for him to reach out to them, to encourage them in the things of God, that they may indeed understand what it truly means to be a Christian in a very hostile situation. But in chapter number two, Paul sort of shifts and changes the subject just a bit. In chapter one, he's talking about representing Christ in the world. But in chapter number two, beginning with verse number one through four, Paul is now explaining to them that he needs them to not infight. That is to say, to get along, to communicate with one another, so that the gospel of Jesus will not be tarnished by the behavior of the church. We're not exactly sure of what was going on at the time that Paul wrote these words in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, but by taking a good look at what Paul says, it seems as if we're looking at the response to confusion that was happening in the church. Let's look at verse number one. Paul says there, is there any such thing as Christians cheering each other up? He says, do you love me enough to want to help me? Does it mean anything to you that we are brothers in the Lord, sharing the same spirit? Are your hearts tender and sympathetic at all? Now, looking at this verse, one might deduce that there are indeed some major problems going on in terms of the relationships that were happening in the church at Philippi. For as you read this side of the conversation, it's almost like hearing one side of a conversation on a telephone. Paul is saying in that first verse, is there any such things as Christians cheering each other up? Could it have been that the church was actually tearing or pulling each other down? Paul says, do you love me enough to want to help me? Does it mean anything to you that we are brothers in the Lord? These words suggest to us that the church of Philippi was somewhat in a disarray, that they were not in harmony and that they were working against each other instead of pulling together, getting along, and working with each other. And Paul ends this verse by saying, are your hearts tender and sympathetic at all? And he reminds them in the verse, the line just before, does it mean anything to you at all that we are in fact brothers in the Lord? So when we look at Philippians chapter number two, we will discover that there are some major principles being taught here. And Paul seems to be saying, hey, can't we get along? The first thing that we'll see is in verse 1 and 2, and that is the incentives for unity. The incentives for unity. And of course, an incentive is a motivation, something that keeps you working hard in order to achieve a certain goal. Paul says, number one, our first incentive for unity should be our need for one another. Paul says to them in that first verse, do you not recognize your need for one another? Do you not recognize that you are inextricably linked to one another? Has it not dawned on you that you are a part of the body of Christ and that you are connected one to another? Paul helps us to understand even in the 21st century that as the people of God, as Christians, as those who belong to Christ, those who follow the way of salvation, those who believe in the scriptures, that we are inextricably linked to one another. We should not have the disharmony and mass disunity that we 
have in the earth today. That in fact, we are all a part of the body of Christ, that we're all brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. Consequently, Paul teaches us that we have a need for one another. As a part of the body of Christ, one part is not more important than another part, but indeed all parts are essential, all parts are necessary, all parts are needed. And so the incentive for unity, even for us today, is that we have to recognize our need for one another. Paul goes on now in the second verse to press his case a bit farther. And listen to what he says. Then make me truly happy by loving each other and agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, working together with one heart and mind and purpose. Paul is saying here that not only is an incentive for us working together and living in unity that of recognizing our need for one another. But secondly, Paul says, we ought to recognize the incentive for unity, number two, having respect for our shepherd. And notice the lower S, the lowercase s, symbolizes that it is talking about him personally as their spiritual leader, pastor, apostle, bishop, or shepherd. Now, it's very important that we understand why Paul is coming to Philippians, to the Philippian church this way. Paul is saying, make me happy by loving each other and agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, working together with one heart and mind and purpose. Why does Paul approach them this way? It's very simple. What we must understand is that if we're a member of a local church, not only do we represent Jesus Christ in the world, but we are also a direct reflection of our pastoral leader. Believe it or not, your behavior and conduct in the world is not only a reflection on your relationship with Jesus Christ, it is also a direct reflection on the teachings that you are receiving from your spiritual leader. So Paul says one of the incentives for the church getting along is that we ought to be mindful of our pastor's work and labor among us and that our lives ought to always reflect that we are taught well at our local church. Now, I remember being a little boy and my parents would say to me quite often when I was a bit mischievous, before we leave this house, let me tell you something. Don't go out here and embarrass me with bad behavior, with being disrespectful, with talking back, and not respecting your elders. They said these words to me. Wherever you mess up is where I'm going to get you. Now, for those of you who may not know what that particular vernacular suggests, what they were informing me was that if I misbehaved in public, they were going to discipline me in public. And when they disciplined me as my parent, it was not, now Reggie, I'm putting you in time out. No such thing. It was time in. There was going to be a belt removed from my father's waist or a switch <laughs> removed from the local branch or tree. And my mother was going to tan my hide. Why did they do this? It wasn't just because they were trying to be mean, although that's all I could see at the time. It was because they understood the hard work and labor that they went through to teach and train me how to be a young man that was growing up in Christianity. And because of that, my behavior ought to always reflect that I have been trained well and that I am responsible to disciplining parents who are doing their part to teach me the way of the Lord. Consequently, if I fail to do that, I fail to represent not only the Lord Jesus Christ, not only the church I was a member of, but my parent, my parents who would discipline me if my actions did not reflect that kind of teaching. In like manner, even if your pastor is younger than you are, your pastor is your spiritual father. Or if your pastor's female, your spiritual 
mother, your spiritual parent. Maybe you've come from another church or uh, you were ordained in some other church if you're a minister, but wherever you are now, your pastor is your spiritual leader. And you must reflect a behavior that is reflective of the level of teaching and discipline and training that they are putting into your life. And that's exactly the approach that the Apostle Paul takes. Then if you want to truly make me happy, make me happy by loving each other by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. You see, a church that wars all the time is a church that will lose its witness every time. No one wants to be connected with Christ if they see Christians always at war against each other, always complaining, always uh, cussing and fussing on social media. And so we have to think about our behavior and how it reflects upon our shepherd. And these are the incentives that Paul gives us in the first two verses. Number one, again, our need for one another. Number two, respect for our shepherd. But let's see the next section of this section of scriptures in Philippians chapter two. Not only does Paul give us the incentives, he also gives us the ingredients for unity in verse three through 11. And in this session, all I want to talk about is verse three and four, and then we'll pick up later. Verse three, don't be selfish. Now, this is what unity looks like. Verse three, don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Now, in that third verse, Paul gives us a clear picture as a spiritual parent of what the ingredients of unity are in the church. He says to us, thirdly, humbly promote others humbly promote other people's notice he says don't be selfish don't be self-centered don't be narcissistic don't be so self-focused that you can't see anybody but you even when you're talking to people when you ask a person how they're doing give them time to respond ask them like you really want to know not like it's a question in passing and then you immediately jump into all you have and all you are and all you've seen and what all you've done that's not being kind. It's not being humble. It is being selfish and self-centered. Paul says, don't live to make a good impression on others. In other words, Paul is saying, don't live for pats on the back. Don't live to try to impress people. There's too many of us acquire things that we don't need to impress people who don't even care. Paul says to us, be humble. Don't be self-centered. He says, think of others as better than yourself. Now, is Paul saying that we should have low self-esteem? Absolutely not. Paul is saying we should live in confidence knowing who we are. You see, when you walk in utmost confidence in who Christ has made you to be, you don't have time to worry about who goes first or whose name is called. You know who you are. And so therefore you can help somebody else. You see, when you walk in confidence in Christ and in who you are, even as a person in your career, in your faith, in your family, in your life, then you can then give strength to someone else who might need more attention than you need. You see, the more confident you are, the less attention you need from the public. When you know who you are, you can be at home by yourself and be just as happy as you would with a hundred close friends. Paul says in the fourth verse, don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too, and in what they are doing. So number three, under the ingredients for unity, Paul tells us humbly promote other people. Number four, he tells us finally, show interest in others. Again, be conversational, be kind, Talk about other people's interests. Ask them questions like, tell me about your vacation or what do you like to do? What are your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing? And then once they answer you, don't take over the conversation and one up them <laughs> with something that is far more exciting than what they like to do. No, Paul teaches us that we ought to take the time to get to know people. That's what creates unity and harmony in the kingdom and in the church. Knowing where people are, knowing what they like to do, knowing what their favorite color is. It's not that you're being nosy, it's that you want to simply get to know them. That's how you build unity in the church and in the kingdom of God. So it's so important for us to build unity and to build 
kingdom and to build community. And that's what Paul is teaching us in these powerful first four verses of Philippians chapter number two. I want to pray with you before we sign off. By all means, if you have a prayer request, you can always send it to me at prayerwithbishop at gmail.com. It will remain between you, myself, and the Lord. I want to pray with you and be your spiritual connection. Be your covering if you don't have a pastor or a shepherd or if you are a pastor who's looking for a bishop to help you with your ministry, to cover you and to pray for you and your wife and your family. I'd love to do that. Simply send me an email. Love to cover you. You can send it to that same email address, prayerwithbishop at gmail.com. Let's pray. God, thank you for these simple yet profound teachings of the Apostle Paul. Thank you, O oh God, for reminding us that it's not all about us, but that we are part of a bigger community and our community needs us. Thank you for reminding us that we have so much to offer to others and that there are so many ways that we can connect with others, that we can build fellowship, that we can build harmony and community. So God, as a bishop in your church, I pray on behalf of the people, God, I stand in the gap and I pray forgiveness for every time that we've made life about us, every time that we have not gotten along with our fellow man, every time we've made a ruckus or a fuss over things that really don't even matter. Forgive us for all the things that we've taken for granted. Forgive us for taking each other for granted. Forgive us for taking kingdom people for granted. And Lord, we repent today. And we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, all impurities, all things that are not like you, and make us what you would have us to be. God, help us to live to please you, because we know that if we live to please you, we will indeed bring joy to those that you have put over us to cover us spiritually. And ultimately, we will experience the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that passes all understanding. Now, God, in these very difficult days, bless your people everywhere. Let your blood cover. Let your love touch. Let your mercy convene. And let your grace and your prosperity cover us. Father, we thank you for these beautiful words from the book of Philippians that challenge and change us to be all you called and created us to be. So, God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for forgiveness for protection, for every blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm telling you, there's something about prayer that just makes you feel better and just know that God is on your side. And I want you to be encouraged today. Can't we all just get along? Of course we can. Let's put the Lord first. We put him first. All other things will come together. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the teaching and the prayer. Give it a thumbs up. And make sure you subscribe. The Lord bless and keep you is my prayer. And don't forget, if you need me, I am available to you. Prayer with Bishop at gmail.com. Have an amazing day. And please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.